Hi, I'm Dave Scudis, a watershed manager at the Mile High Flood District. I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about the district's modern approach to urban stream design. But before I do that, I want to show you what came before. So let me share my screen. So 50 years ago, it wasn't uncommon to bury a creek in a culvert underground, like Westerly Creek here at 16th Avenue. These long culverts were often undersized, leading to significant flood risk. Here, you see the floodplain on the surface because the culvert isn't big enough. Inferior infrastructure becomes the taxpayer's problem. I've spent most of my 20 year career building mitigation projects to address situations like this. I worked on a $9 million project north of here at Montview a few years back. That's me standing there under the bridge. We transitioned to a more open design like this because they can carry a lot more water. The concrete is there to keep the thing glued together because of how narrow it is. Think of your garden hose when you stick your thumb over it. The water speeds up. The same thing applies here. The confinement leads to higher velocities, which necessitates all of that concrete. Concrete low flow channels were in vogue for a while. This gave way to boulder edging with a loose rock bottom. By the early 2000s, environmental regulation had evolved to where all of this rock and concrete was harder to permit. So out of necessity, our designs became more environmentally sensitive. Around the same time, we were also starting to deal with the consequences of our own infrastructure decisions. Some of these really structural features were turning out to be really high maintenance. For example, concrete lining wears out. Drop structures fail. This concrete structure got completely flipped over because it didn't have a seepage cutoff wall. This grouted boulder structure had such bad seepage issues that Jake there could go spelunking in the void underneath it. Not something I would recommend. Here's one on Sand Creek at Quebec that's starting to fall apart. This 25 foot drop structure will probably cost millions of dollars to fix. That area of pooled water is where boulders used to sit and when they got undermined, they fell into the void. Here you can see the hole goes further back so it's a matter of time before the whole thing crumbles. Here's a picture of our modern ideal, a naturalized channel design that allows the water to spread out when there's more flow, instead of getting deeper and deeper when there's more flow. Wider instead of deeper makes it possible to achieve stability with vegetation instead of a bunch of rock and concrete. It puts less stress on the bed and banks. And this is an engineered channel on Westerly Creek that used to be buried in a box culvert under the runways of the old Stapleton Airport. And this sort of design works. Here is a photo of Westerly Creek and MLK Boulevard. Pay attention to that bridge in the background. Here it is at the peak of the 2013 flood. Here it is the very next day after the flood. And then back to this photo, which is actually eight months after the flood. These images show you how we've learned to build better infrastructure. Mimicking natural processes to create infrastructure that looks like nature, something we call high functioning and low maintenance streams or HEFLAMs. I know that sounds goofy. Uh, if we could think of a better acronym, we would have by now. The function part includes flood protection through stormwater conveyance and resilience. It also includes ecosystem services, water quality, recreation, protection when there is a flood, value on sunny days when there's no flood. The low maintenance part means we can maintain this with a weed whacker and a trash bag rather than big yellow construction equipment. In trying to mimic nature, we're using a science called fluvial geomorphology. Fluvial means river related, geo means earth, morph means shape, and ology means study of. So river, earth, shape, study. The changes you see in this river are an outcome or expression of the amount of water, the type of valley this sits in, and the type of soil that's naturally occurring here. So a geomorphologist studies the patterns of the shapes you see and tries to predict them. I'm gonna grossly oversimplify this, but in simple terms, they consider geology and hydrology. Let's start with geology. What kind of valley are we in? Is it a confined mountain stream? Something a little more open in the foothills like this? 
or is it this flat wide valley like Second Creek out by the airport? What are the naturally occurring soils in the stream bed? Are they big rocks, small cobbles and gravels, really fine sands or clays, or whatever the hell this is. I happen to have a yellow rubber glove on me at the time, so I took that picture. Don't ask, because I'm not gonna tell you why I had the rubber glove. And then hydrology. How big of a watershed are we in? Where are we in that watershed? When are we? What are the land use conditions today? What will they be in the future? And what does that mean for flows as the watershed urbanizes around that stream? So when we talk about geomorphically informed design, the, geomorph the geomorphologist looks at all these factors and helps us figure out the cross section, the corridor width, the plan form, and the profile that will help this reach of this stream mimic nature and rely on vegetation for stability. And context is everything. In a way, it's the highest functioning and lowest maintenance channel we can achieve given the context. In Greenfields, we've got a blank slate. So we'll end up with something like First Creek upstream of Tower Road. When we're in retrofit or infill locations, we have to get much more creative. Conveyance is king, but can we, what can we still achieve for function and maintenance? We don't like walls, but on this project, it was either that or demolish some homes. This clever design on Sanderson Gulch skipped the walls and buried a box culvert that's only there for major events. Daily and minor events get carried through a healthy, naturalized channel on top, high function. It'll be higher maintenance than we'd like, but in a retrofit, we may not have a choice. We wouldn't approve this in a green field, but in an infill, it's a creative solution to get more value. So a Heflum's design, it's not cookie cutter. There's no set recipe. We don't just need people who can cook, we need chefs. That's where geomorphologists come in. At the site planning stage, we need their help in defining the corridor that's necessary to preserve for the creek. If the developer wants to use the easy button for site planning, we have a stream management corridor layer on our GIS mapping. It depicts a corridor that we're sure is wide enough. But keep in mind, detailed analysis would likely result in something narrower, which benefits the developer. During preliminary and final design, the geomorphologist helps with that cross-section plan form and profile in concert with the engineer and an ecologist to design a plant palette that helps us achieve stability. This is what we do on our own projects and it's what we expect from developer built projects as well. Here is a nearly completed project on the West Fork of Second Creek in the High Point development. As we get our plantings installed, as the area urbanizes to put more water in the creek, it'll evolve into something similar to First Creek here upstream of Tower Road, infrastructure that looks like nature. It takes a multidiscipline team and planning for it from the get-go, and perhaps more importantly, buy-in from local government planning, public works, open space, really the entire community is critical so we can avoid these, ta these expensive taxpayer-funded mitigation projects in the future. I'm Dave Scudis, a watershed manager at the Mile High Flood District. Thank you for watching.